A triathlon is nothing more than a childish endeavor, taken to fanatical extremes. The world's most demanding began with a brisk two-mile swim in the chilled waters of the Mediterranean Sea, along the rugged coastline of the French Riviera. The next round of self-punishment was a torturous tour of the Maritime Alps, a myriad of hairpin turns and dangerous switchbacks. It was an elevator ride over 75 miles of undulating pavement and nerve-wracking cliffs. For the fortunate ones, fatigue was the only toll this treacherous ride would exact. Finally, a foot race to the finish, 20 miles of flat, blisteringly hot pavement, ironically set along the scenic beaches of the Côte d'Azur. It was unquestionably the ultimate test of athletic endurance, the World Triathlon Championship in Nice, France. Hi everybody, Ross here, and this is episode 5 of the Streak Podcast. The audio you just heard was from the CBS coverage of the 1987 Nice Triathlon. Nice was one of three races at the time calling itself a world championship. The other two were the Hawaii Ironman, which started using the word world in 1982, and the World Sprint Triathlon Championships that took place in Perth, Western Australia in January of 1987. 1987 was the sixth edition of the Nice Triathlon, and it was the first one that Mark Allen didn't attend and win. But it was the first edition with aero bars. Nice was also the third race in the so-called Triple Crown. That's USTS Nationals at Hilton Head, Hawaii and Nice in a four-week period. It wasn't an official series, just a name made up by Triathlete magazine when these three events easily had the season's best fields. Spoiler alert, Rick Wells wins Nice in 1987 to bookend the season after winning Perth in January and Kirsten Hansen took the women's race two weeks after her victory in Hilton Head. Ken Glar and Scott Tinley were the only athletes to finish in the top 10 of all three Triple Crown events in 1987. But enough about those races, as I've got some Triple Crown episodes planned for the future. I'll probably cover 1985 to 1989. Over the last couple of years, I've been buying up vintage triathlon magazines on eBay. Some of them I'd previously owned, but they hadn't survived multiple international house moves and a few loft purges. I'm a big fan of magazines because I like to have nice paper objects in my hands. I still buy French and German triathlon publications and I'm thinking of starting my own A5 triathlon zine in 2023. Away from triathlon, I subscribe to the Golfer's Journal, Like the Wind, Valden and Bicycle Quarterly. They're all attractive magazines focusing on longer form storytelling rather than being driven by advertisements, how-to articles and equipment reviews. I started collecting Triathlete UK in July 1988, then early editions of 220 magazine and British triathlon scene. On a family holiday to Florida in 1989, I even picked up a few copies of the US version of Triathlete. To understand the landscape of magazines serving the UK triathlon scene in the 1980s, we need to first look at the emergence of two titles in the USA. In February 1983, the team from Swim Swim magazine launched Triathlon magazine out of Santa Monica. The year before, they had tested the concept by printing one issue of a magazine they called Swim Bike Run. Then in May 1983, Bill Kotowski launched Triathlete magazine, spelt T-R-I hyphen athlete out of San Francisco. An investor in Kotowski's project was Belgian Jean-Claude Garou. He was the publisher of Winning Magazine, a glossy photo-filled monthly magazine focused on European professional cycling. Before long, Garou had bought the triathlete operation from Kotowski. Both magazines were fueled by the huge growth in the US race scene and the public awareness of the sport that happened the year before. The Hawaii Ironman had two memorable editions in 1982. The February race had the TV famous crawl off between Julie Moss and Kathleen McCartney. Then the October event saw a comeback win for Dave Scott, ahead of the defending champion Scott Tinley, as he edged the course record towards nine hours. 
Another factor was the launch of the United States Triathlon Series. Knowing that not all athletes wanted to complete an Ironman, Carl Thomas and Jim Curl launched a series of five short course events in 1982. The series was due to expand to 11 events in 1983, providing plenty of stories for triathlon and triathlete to write. By 1985, triathlon was also growing rapidly in Europe. The European Triathlon Union had just been formed and the first European Championships were about to be held. Immenstadt in Germany would host the short course and Almir in the Netherlands the long course. But Jean-Claude Garraud was particularly interested in what was happening in France. The Nice Triathlon was already on its fourth edition and France had a thriving club scene. Their Grand Prix was also about to be relaunched after a few organisational snafus during the 1984 season. So in June 1985, the team at Triathlete debuted a standalone French language title to cover the French and Belgian scenes. It ran for 35 years and closed at the end of 2020. Back in the US, despite the growth of triathlon, it was decided that advertising revenue couldn't support two magazines. So in July 1986, Triathlon and Triathlete merged to create Triathlete without a hyphen. Post-merger, production tasks were shared between the two teams before Jean-Claude Garraud bought the magazine outright in 1988. Although French speakers had a standalone version of Triathlete being produced out of Garraud's Brussels office, triathletes in the UK had to go through two intermediate steps before getting theirs. The first move in January 1986 was an eight-page blue paper UK edition inserted into the middle of the US edition. Importantly, Triathlete could now be found in newsagents such as Menzies and WH Smith. From 1983 until 1985, it was only available in the UK to subscribers. Then in May 1987, the blue insert was replaced by a colour version, but still bundled with the US edition of Triathlete. Finally, at the end of 1987, Triathlete UK became a 52-page standalone magazine, with a German version being launched in January 1988. Although the US, German, UK and French magazines each had a different editorial team, stories and images were often shared. Note also that the hyphen in Triathlete was still being used in Europe. In March 1989, Triathlete finally had some rivals in the UK. This is when British Triathlon Scene and 220 Magazine were launched. British Triathlon Scene closed sometime in 1990, but 220 is still around in 2022. The founder, John Lilly, sold it in 1997. Here's a passage from John Lilly's blog about the beginnings of 220. Quote, in 1988, I came back from Ironman Hawaii with my Total Fitness Tri Club mates, Trevor Gunning and Kevin Ferris. Satisfied that we had all finished the race, got our medals and t-shirts and had a remarkable experience on the Big Island. I'd go so far to say that we were buzzing. A month later, Triathlete Magazine came out. I read the Hawaii race report with a big smile on my face and then turned to the results page. Nothing. Despite a good turnout of Brits, not one was mentioned. I was incensed. You'd better start your own magazine, someone half-joked to me. It was only a half-joke because I was a serial starter of businesses and at the time one was quite profitable. So I had the wherewithal to do it, so I did. End quote. In 1989, Jean-Claude Garraud's publishing company, Off Press, had financial problems and in early 1990, Triathlete UK disappeared from shops. But a few months later, in May 1990, the US version of the magazine with the UK cover mount came back. Probably seizing the opportunity presented by the disappearance of British triathlon scene and the semi-demise of triathlete, in May 1990, Running Magazine launched a triathlon supplement called Triathlon. Several articles in the first issue were written by Karin Seitvogel. Karin previously worked at Triathlete with Jean-Claude Garraud and persuaded the editor of running, Nick Troop, to let her launch Triathlon. 
Karen also owns the specialist triathlon shop Holy Fit in London. I recently had an informative exchange with her on Twitter. It's not easy finding people who remember and want to chat about triathlon in the 1980s. I was a big fan of Running Magazine. I thought they did a great job of covering elite road racing, both in the UK and abroad. But the spin-off quarterly title Triathlon only made it to maybe half a dozen issues before Running Magazine was absorbed into the US title Runner's World in 1993. So 220 Magazine definitely won the battle of the late 80s slash early 90s triathlon magazines. I think their low-budget, quirky approach appealed more to the UK triathletes' interests and humour. They covered the big races and the small races. They even organised their own races so that they had more to write about. I've got pretty much the whole collection from 1989 until 1997, except the first issue and a few crucial ones I'd love to own, like October 1991 and September 1992. Every time I flick through a few vintage copies, I'm reminded of how good the magazine was back then. I often like to give myself some homework at the end of an episode, so this time it's to find out more about Tri News, which was the British Triathlon Association's members' magazine. It was launched A5 photocopied zine style in January 1983. And Endurance Sports Magazine, that when it came out in the spring of 1985, was promoted as, quote, the only specialist magazine in the UK covering the needs of the long-distance swimmer, cyclist, runner and canoeist, end quote. I'm also a big fan of francophone triathlon magazines, such as Triathlete and TED, so I'll definitely dig into the history of them in the future. So that's it. Remember to check out thestreetpodcast.com forward slash podcast forward slash five for the show notes to this episode. If you've got a question, a correction, some extra historical information, or just want to say hi, you can email me at thestreetpodcast at gmail.com. I'll leave you now with more pre-race chit-chat and the start of the 1987 Nice Triathlon. The defending champions were not present for this race. Mark Allen, the only man to ever win the event, did not compete. He was ill. And on the women's side, two-time winner Linda Buchanan chose not to attend, which fueled pre-race speculation about the chances of such world-class athletes as Scott Tinley, a two-time Ironman champion and one of the founding fathers of this sport. Scott Molina showed up for the race, but he was not in top shape. And Richard Wells won the world championship at the shorter distance triathlons. He was certainly the fastest swimmer in Nice. And among the women, Colleen Cannon had excelled in the non-glamorous distances and now felt she had improved in all sports to the point that she was a serious contender. England's Sarah Coop had pointed to this race for a full year. She's a three-time European champion. Covering the race with me was Craig Nasback, and he spent some time with two of the American favorites. I'm with Kirsten Hanson and Mike Pick, both known to be specialists at short-distance triathlons, both national champions this year. Now they're stepping up to the longer-distance triathlon at the World Championship distance. Kirsten, you've dominated the shorter distances this year on the American scene. What makes you think you can win the World Championship at a longer distance? Well, I am confident that I have a lot of endurance, but it's just been a matter of fitting one of these long events into a busy, busy schedule this season, so I'm excited to give it a try. Mike, you too have been the dominant force on the American scene. You did the Ironman triathlon two weeks ago at a longer distance. Are you ready to come back two weeks later? I think I am. Uh, we're just going to wait until I get on the course to find out. Uh, I've done all my homework, so we'll just have to wait and see. As the competitors went through their final mental preparations, take a look at the swim course they were about to attack in the Bay of Angels. The swimmers were able to follow the route by aiming for well-marked buoys. The first leg straight out, away from shore, then due west for nearly three-quarters of a mile, make the turn, and head home against the current. Fortunately for the athletes that morning, the Mediterranean was calm. The water like glass, 63 degrees. That was a little bit chilly. Perfect conditions, though, for the elite like Scott Tinley in blue, as well as the 900 other competitors who were poised for the start of the race. So like a large school of fish, the triathletes began their journey. And the sky blue waters of the Mediterranean turned white with turbulence. 
it was here that many got kicked or punched or pushed aside. But the elite competitors were able to sprint to the front and away from the pack of less skilled thrill seekers. And the man who took the lead was Richard Wells. Wells was late getting to the starting line, but he called that a blessing in disguise. Because he wasn't standing with the other leading swimmers, he was able to enter the water with a sprint start, like the one he used to use in his old specialty, the 100-meter freestyle. He reached the first buoy with a surprising lead, fulfilling his objective of being far enough ahead to keep the others from drafting.